Hello, welcome to the self-learning platform by Dr. Shushma Singh. Today we start Unit 20, Socialism. And our topic is Karl Marx and Socialism. Marx's importance in the history of the struggle for socialism lies in the fact that he was the first man who could propound a theory of socialism, which could, as noted earlier, rival and stand on an equal footing with the theory of capitalism developed by Ricardo and Adam Smith. Marx did not simply propound a theory in the old style, but developed a doctrine which unified or at least so he claimed theory with practice such that theory could guide practice and practice could rectify the error in theory. In short, what Marx did was to build up a theory of revolutionary action, identifying the class which will carry out the revolutionary task of replacing capitalism with socialism. In a general historical theory of in what has now come to be known as historical materialism, why and how human societies change, and what further changes are in store for human society. Marx showed that historical change is neither accidental nor a result of sheer will that it has laws which are dialectical. Contradictions is the essence of dialectics. This contradiction is not logical or like incapabilities in an argument, but an inner attribute of reality. Social reality is more discernibly marked by this inner contradiction or in contradictions to logical let us call contradiction in Marxistian view as ontological. This fact of contrary pulls or opposition within a reality impulse a moment in reality. In other words, society changes because of its inner contradictory pulls towards the evolving stages. Like in other earlier stages, feudalism, for example, so in capitalism, it is its internal contradictions which propel it towards change into something else. How? What are dialectics and their laws and the adject working of this etc. Every mode of production, some total of forces and relations of productions gives rise to two classes in perpetual opposition to each other. One is the ruling or the exploiting class and the other is the oppressed or the exploited class. The constant conflict and opposition between these two classes to get the better of the other is class struggle. Marx remarks in the very beginning of Communist Manifesto that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. He then goes on to remark our epoch, the epoch of Burji's processes, however, this distinctive feature. It has simplified the class antagonism. Society as a whole is more and more splitting up 
into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, Burjis and proletariat. So, one pole of the Marxist structure of fury is class struggle. It was in terms of this that Marx had concluded after a very detailed study of capitalist mode of production that contradictions within it would go on intensifying, leading to increasingly intense struggle between the capitalist and the working class. This would give rise to a revolutionary consciousness among the workers and teach them that only a takeover of power from the minority of capitalists could create conditions to free the working class from exploitation and lead to the emancipation of society. All this sounds neat and on the face of it, it is persuasive too. But it begs the question, what needs an answer is? Why should the contradiction intensify so much that the proletariat will feel compelled to overthrow the Burji's rule and institute its own in place of that? There is an elaborate answer for this in Marx, which is what makes Marx claim that his system is scientific. But it is not easy to summarize. Still, an outline is required to complete the answer. This then takes us to the second pole of Marxian analysis, which looks at the future of class struggle from the viewpoint of the process of accumulation of capital and the rate of exploitation. These two are internally related to each other. There is first the appropriation of the surplus value from the laborers, the laborers who is given a wage is paid at the cost of reproducing his labor power. That is what it costs to buy the subsistence goods for living. In other words, the labor power of the worker is bought in the same way as any other commodity, say iron or clothes or whatever else is needed to produce further goods, that is at the cost of its production. So labor power is like a commodity among other commodities. It has been established that he reproduces that much of value in four by five hours of work, whereas a worker normally works for eight to ten hours. The extra hours of work that he puts in is the basis of additional built-in structure and relational feature of capitalist production which has nothing to do with cheating or theft. It is legal and necessary for capitalism. Such a process goes on along with improvements in the technical means of production. Over a long period of time, the cost of machinery and other fixed capital known as constant capital becomes more and more expensive in relation to the cost of hiring labor power, referred to as variable capital. In other words, in the overall composition of the capital, there is 
an increase in the relative importance of constant capital versus variable capital this goes on as the capitalist mode of production progresses this marx shows leads to the centralization of capital that is the ownership of capital gets into fewer and fewer hands the big fish eating the small ones as we popularly hear this marks further shows leads to a fall in the rate of profit to compensate for this the capitalist tries to intensify exploitation which means he tries to increase the rate of exploitation and this is resisted by the workers this results in the improvement of the working class in relative as well as absolute terms with with the capitalist this marx demonstrates will necessarily lead to greater and greater class struggles leading eventually to the overthrow of capitalism and the capture of power by the workers that is why marx could say in the manifesto that what the bourgeois therefore produces above all are its own grave diggers the first stage of working class rule is the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat which prepares the way for the establishment of socialism which then paves the way for communism the stage where everyone works according to capacity and takes according to need the world of choice now next point is critic of marxism and democratic socialism at the end of the unit it, it is important to look at a two way challenge to marxism that emerged at the end of the 19th century this took the shape during the course of 20th century to evolutionary or democratic socialism many other versions like guild socialism and syndicalism and so on are also there but we will not deal with these as these are by now unimportant and can also be easily read in any chapter on socialism in a standard theory book when the workers revolution did not take place as marx had foreseen that it soon will there emerged strong reservations about marxism as a body of doctrines one who expressed this in systematic terms was a long time german marxist edward bernstein in a book entitled evolutionary socialism he elaborated a whole different route to and tactics for achieving a socialist society the other line of development took shape not only because revolution did not come about but because a large group of british socialist has instinct reservations about marxism they thought that some of its goals and methods and tactics will result in authoritarian despotic politics they took exceptions to goals like the dictatorship of the proletariat class warfare 
violent overthrow of capitalism etc to further an alternative way of achieving fabian society in the middle of the 1880s and this version eventually came to be known as fabian socialism important names with this tradition are sydney and beatrice webb g d h cole bernard shaw lasky tiny and many others remember that some leading indian nationalist leader led by nehru during the freedom struggle were deeply influenced by this current and which after independence gave birth to in the middle of 1950s to the idea of a socialist pattern of society bunstein argued that the wages of workers are not falling but are relatively rising because the rate of profit is not as marx argued declining and therefore the expected improvement of the workers and the consequent uprising will not come about rather the workers would get more and more integrated into the capitalist system hence the need is to work within the capitalist system by accepting its institutional framework of parliament elections open political activity and thereby striving to improve the condition of the working class the class of workers has already become the majority and by proper organization it is now possible to win a majority in parliament and strive towards socialist ideas in short they declared that there is no need for revolution this view point came to be termed in organized marxism as revisionism and reformism a prerogative way of referring to those who abdicated their responsibility of working for the revolution through the different routes these two critics of marxism came to similar conclusion which can be stated as the core tenets of de- democratic socialism four of these deserve a mention first socialism is not as marx thought a historical necessity or inevitable but a moral need for the good of humanity humanity can realize its potential only within a radical egalitarian ethos for this to happen people will have to be won over for socialism and parliamentary majorities gained by the caring political education among the masses it is therefore important to realize secondly that in a transition to socialism it is not only the working class but the entire people who will play a part working class as a predominant part of the world will no doubt be strategic but middle classes too can be imbued with socialist ideas and can play a major role in building public opinion thirdly the route to socialism will not be through a violent rupture as marx thought but would be by a gradual action in this by degrees 
through closely interconnected legislative measures, the structure of socialist economy can be put in place. Equal opportunity of effective participation in the running of the state, cooperation rather than competition, equality to fully develop human personality and similar other values will become norms of society. And lastly, the state will remain an institution of strategic importance through a series of nationalization measures. The state will ensure that the private ownership of the means of production will be socialized, that is, different forms of state and cooperative ownership in industry and public services like healthcare, education, electricity, railways, etc. will be instituted. Everybody will thus have equal access and entitlement to goods and services. That is how the planned economy of public ownership of means of production together with the deepening of democracy and freedom of intellect will be the way for the emancipation of humanity. Socialism is no simple monolithic doctrine that Soviet communism was. It represents a variation upon variation, a multiplicity of viewpoints, but as we have seen, sharing some core assumptions and presuppositions. One such presupposition is that Every human being is capable of making an equal contribution to the common good. And this can only be done when human beings exert together for common welfare. Socialism is a special form of democracy which extends the idea of freedom from civil and political rights to equal claims on economic well-being and social status and this can only be achieved when human beings cease to be egoistically competitive as under capitalism. So long as capitalism is there with its exploitation and disregard for human dignity in fear of efficiency of production and market equilibrium. The yearning for socialism will be there. The revolt against Burji's property will not come to an end. Here we want to wind up this lecture and we have come to the end of the unit. Thank you so much for your attention.